Welcome to Vantage Fishing Radio, where we discuss the hot bite and all things fishing. With your hosts, Dustin Clark and Lewis Chapman. Fish on. Welcome back to Vantage Fishing Radio. Uh, Lewis Chapman here with my partner in crime and fishing as well. He's really good at crime though, Dustin Clark. Um, he will he will demolish a burrito from Big City Burrito up in Fort Collins. So just, oh, that's just right. keep, an eye on your, keep an eye on your burritos. Um, yeah, so we're back, episode 13. We did 12 last week. Kind of a little bit on a roll. How you doing, man? Uh, you know what? Doing pretty good. How about yourself? Can't complain. Um, you know, things have been going going well, healing. Looking forward to some fishing in the future, but I've uh, been able to do some fishing-related things lately, so uh, no complaints. And that's always good to hear, you know, being on the mend and uh, and just gearing up for the uh, the next portion of, uh, yeah, there really is no seasons when it comes to fishing. It just means that the, the water's hard or the water's soft. <laughs> Very true. It's all about figuring out the bite. <laughs> you just want to chase whatever bite's going to be the best. So in that way, you get a little bit of every species too, because they all Absolutely. have really good times for the bite. But um, as always, I want to welcome our uh, listeners. So thank you for tuning in to Vantage Fishing Radio and uh, reading our content on our Facebook page and our website and our blogs. And um, so let's cover a little bit about what we've been uh, doing. So Dustin, just uh, from what I understand, you went to, to Clear Creek. Did you want to give it a little brief like uh, kind of teaser about what you're going to talk about later? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Clear Creek, uh, never fished it before and uh, kind of wanted to go out there. Somebody had asked me uh, to go with them figured you know what it's it's far out of the way it's away from tournaments uh and to be honest with you it, it's an awesome little gym uh just nestled right outside of Buena Vista so um you know had a great time out there uh, first time in a long time I actually got cold uh even with all my gear on so um look forward to uh, to talking about it this episode and that's Clear Creek Reservoir, right? I think I said Clear Creek, so I don't want people to think you're ice fishing on the creek, even though most no, people no, probably so this, would. But just to just to clarify, yep, this is Clear Creek Reservoir. It is a state wildlife area. So uh, if you're looking for it, it is. Uh, if you look for Clear Creek Reservoir and you're not quite finding it, you can always look up uh, in any of the CPW documentation for the state wildlife areas. So, uh, like I said, it's a nice little gym nestled just outside of Buena Vista. So a little bit later, and I think that'll be our first segment, we'll dive into the, the nitty gritty on your first trip to, to Clear Creek and uh, hopefully many more for us because that's one we have on the radar for some uh, float tubing in the spring and summer. Absolutely. So, and then um, I haven't had any fishing trips. Have you been up to anything else besides Clear Creek? Uh, you know what? Outside of uh, Stagecoach last weekend, uh, not really. Just kind of uh, keep it a very low key this uh this ice season uh not even doing any tournaments gotcha um you know so the few things i've been up to since the last uh show is um went through and uh did some i don't know kind of renovations on our website and kind of upgraded a little bit so the website website's got a little bit different look and the same but the same kind of a field we'll have the same information so if everybody wants to go out there and, and take a look at the website tell us what you think uh give us some good feedback see if maybe we've got something that doesn't make sense or something that just doesn't uh quite belong let us know uh or any good ideas that we should add uh we're all ears on that so i've been spent a good good day doing that and then um yesterday afternoon and then this evening i was able to tour and then have an interview with uh the vice president from the Boulder Flycasters, from which is pretty much the Boulder Trout Unlimited, and they have a huge project going on in Boulder County, uh, where they've, with some other partners, been revamping uh, Boulder Creek in, in kind of the middle, like central Boulder area. So I just wanted to tease that a little bit. So that kind of got me excited, and now I even want to bust out the fly rods. So that might even happen in the next few weeks. But um, that's that's what I've been up to. Well, you know, it may not sound as much fun as uh, as fishing, but uh, you know, always good good things come out of uh, some of your research and talking to people. I know that I have personally benefited from uh, the connections that you have, and I'm sure some of our listeners have as well. Yeah, for sure. And you know, it's it's awesome to to be able to reach out and and a lot of this stuff I just come across stuff and I get curious and then I start digging and 
and then it, you know, we, we figure everything out and then we, we work hard to share it and we'll share this through blogs, through the radio show. And we got some other stuff coming up too. You know, like I've been doing a lot of research and follow up on the whole uh, power plant situation with the possibly contaminated fish. So I've been wrapping that up. So here in the next few weeks, we'll probably have a big thing out on that and, and, and whatnot. And plus we've got a lot of other guests with a, a lot of great fishing talk that might not be so controversial coming up too. So, um, yeah, pretty excited for what the future of Vantage Fishing Radio is going to hold the, you know, the rest of the winter and into the spring. Uh, how about it? You ready to jump into uh, ice fishing at Clear Creek Reservoir? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so like I said, yeah, I, I went to Clear Creek Reservoir uh, this last Saturday uh, with my with my dad, my son, and a, a good friend of mine, and um, never really fished it before. So I, I did a little bit of research online, went back, took a look at a couple of our blogs that we had written. Um, I personally, I like to use stuff like Google Maps uh, to see if I can even figure out where the edges are, or maybe even a drop off. Uh, sometimes I, I do pretty good with guessing. Uh, kind of showed up and you know there's one or two vehicles in the parking lot so uh, went down drove down the road kind of took a look at the inlet noticed there was some sketchy ice down there I couldn't tell you whether or not uh, it was any good we decided to, to come back to the boat ramp so a little bit about Clear Creek Reservoir itself um, uh, it is like I said just outside of Buena Vista just below Twin Lakes and, and the cool part about this is if you're gonna make this drive just a little bit north of Clear Creek, obviously, is Twin Lakes. A little bit north of that, you have Turquoise Lake. And if you really wanted to get, uh, you know, um, some hiking in, I think uh, you can. I'm pretty sure you can. You can hike into Mount Elbert Forbay to ice fish there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there, Lewis. Uh, you know, you know more than me on this. I, I've actually just crunched numbers and stuff. I have not actually studied maps on this lake yet. Okay. So, uh, so Clear Creek Reservoir, uh, super easy. To get there, uh, it's right along the, the Arkansas River. So if, if you know, ice fishing is not treating you too well and there's a good flow, you can always try to, to give your hand on, on some fly fishing. Uh, that day, the day that we went, we showed up, it was about negative 10. So that might not be the, the smartest thing to do is uh, get out there with, with that kind of um, cold. Uh, so a little bit more about it. Uh, it is a state wildlife area. There's one boat ramp. Uh, there's some dispersed camping, obviously a nice big dam. Um, I pulled up. The first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to read the actual regulations posted at the lake. Because I know anything that's on the internet can be taken and twisted or maybe not 100% accurate. Um, I was very surprised to find out how many actual species they have there. So uh, they have, of course, rainbow trout, uh, the tiger muskie that we talked about in the previous episode. Uh, they do have some kokanee salmon in there, uh, and they actually list out the kokanee salmon. They have technically the way they had it listed was breeding kokanee and sterile kokanee that they have in it. So sterile would be the, the silver, and the breeding would be the nice red kokanee. Uh, just to kind of, I think, more or less to, to let people know if you're catching a red one, it, it might be, you know, during spawning season, which we don't have to worry about right now. Um, but... I also found they have brown trout in there, which I wasn't expecting. I, any, nowhere else that I looked, I just pulled up the CPW page, and they do have brown trout. They also have cut bow, as well as white sucker. So to me, you know, it, it is a very good lake to, to have a well-rounded day if you're going to um, go out and target certain species. Uh, no. I will also say, go ahead. No, I was going to say, is, is there another lake in the state that this lake kind of is similar to or reminds you of? Well, you know, if you replaced uh, tiger muskie with pike uh, and got rid of the kokanee and put in um, perch, uh, I'd probably be looking at, uh, you know, maybe a spinny, 11 mile type of deal. Uh, granted, my experience with it so far uh, was, was smaller trout, but... I could definitely see the potential there to get in some big ones. Yeah. So I, wh while you're talking there, I pulled up Google maps and I went to the satellite imagery off of that. I, I, I need to fork over the money, the real deal for like scouting for fishing, Google earth, but it, you're going to pay a premium to use Google earth. So I'm stuck on Google maps to pinch of pennies. Cause I'd rather buy another Z ray, 
Um, but looking at it, like, yeah, that's what I was thinking too, is spinny too, just because on that west side, it looks like it's super shallow. I can see all the different uh, arms of the river coming in in different directions on that west side. It splits off, and it looks like real weedy type areas, and it eventually leads into deeper water as you transition to the middle and to the uh, east side of the lake um, for sure. And so I can see where there's a lot of deep water next to shallow water areas with lots of forks and stuff coming on that would be great for for brown trout like you were talking you know those browns love hanging out 20 40 even 60 feet of water but they'll come up to feed on rainbows and cokes and and things like that and um so i could see how that would be a great brown trout lake oh yeah i'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, google earth because I, I do subscribe to it uh, i do pay uh the fee for the one that i have uh, and I use it quite frequently. It gives a lot better detail, and that's kind of what I was using to to figure out some of the uh, the points of interest that I really wanted to see at this lake. Um, so, to my surprise, you know, obviously cutbow, kokanee. I was not expecting to see brown trout in this lake. I thought it was just rainbows, white suckers, and tiger musky. Um, now, the the gillnet report that I'm looking at as we as we talk about this. Uh, doesn't show too favorably, favorably for cut bows or, or kokanee, but the cool part about that is I did catch a kokanee, uh, my very first fish out on the ice that day. Uh, couldn't get too far. There was two feet of snow on top of the ice, so lugging around equipment uh, made it a little bit more challenging, especially when I had people with me that uh, I had to bring extra gear for. Um, one of the unique things that I took into consideration here was I didn't realize where the boat ramp was in in conjunction to where the dam was and where the inlet was. Uh, I spoke with a gentleman while I was out there, kind of asked him how frequently he fished it, and, you know, just get to know my, my fellow ice anglers. And he told me right off the boat ramp, you know, just, just walk out and pop a couple of holes and you should be able to, to catch at least rainbows. Well, to my surprise, 50 feet off the oh, boat Dustin, ramp. Dustin, I lose you. Oh, am I here? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're still here, but I think we missed your last sentence there. If you want to start start back just a, a second or two ago. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I spoke with a with a gentleman while I was out there, and uh, asked him how frequently he fished. Uh, he said he, he went to Clear Creek all the time. Uh, the fact that there were even three or four vehicles parked in the parking lot uh, took him by surprise. He says there's never normally this many people out there. Uh, and I asked him first. My first question to him was I, I asked about the tiger muskie. Has he ever caught one? Has he seen anybody pull anything out? And was he going to go for tiger musky that day? Uh, to my surprise, he said, nope, I've never seen anybody pull anything uh, like a tiger musky out of this lake. He knows that they're in there. People have seen pictures of tiger musky being pulled out of that lake. He's just not been fortunate enough to uh, land one or, or, or see one within 10,000 casts. Uh, so I was a little discouraged with that, but, uh, you know, uh, tiger musky, I, I know they can be challenging, and it's something to, to work toward. Uh, his his tip to me for the day was to basically go 50 feet off of the boat ramp. And I said, really? Um, much to my surprise, I get out there, I drill my first hole sitting in 26 feet of water, right off the boat ramp, 50 feet. I said, okay, well, I walked a little bit further. I found 30 feet. And then I think I found 35. I was like, okay, so it gets very deep very, very quickly. Decided to set up in the, uh, the 24 to 26 foot range. And uh, sure enough, uh, first jig down, my buddy Chris, uh, we weren't fishing, but maybe 10 minutes. Uh, I hadn't even had time to pull out a rod because uh, I was drilling holes and helping my son set up. And he dropped down a, a nice uh, pink and white atomic teaser and boom, rainbow trout off. Uh, nothing quite like you're going to see out of Spenny or some of the big ones you're going to see out of 11 Mile. I think, uh, I think it might have been about 15 inches. Real nice dark color to it. Uh, so I was extremely excited. Um, <clears throat> so I got to fishing, and the minute I put my Vexlar in the water, there were fish everywhere. I was like, oh, man, this is going to be a good day. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't as fast and as furious as, as I was hoped. Uh, we kind of got lulled into a false sense of security with uh, the fish being everywhere. They were very, very, very finicky. So I um, spent four hours on the ice caught about five or six um sitting at 26 foot of water uh my first fish of the day was a, a nice silver coconut about the same size you'd see out of dylan 
And so I was kind of excited. I was like, oh, you know what? Maybe there's a school of kokanee that's moving in. Unfortunately, that did what, not happen. What did you catch that coke on? I caught that coke on a brown trout cast master. See, I knew you were a criminal. Look at you in the coke. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. It's more than burritos. It's burritos <laughs> and coke. I got it. It's all making sense now. <laughs> so, um, you know, I watched fish regularly, probably every three to four minutes, come in, kind of check out what was going on. And then head right back out. Uh, I did get a couple of reactionary strikes. Uh, it was more of, you know, a, a slight jig and a pause. And then, you know, uh, a slight jig again just to see if I could get them. And overall, it was a great day. There, I believe there, there was some sort of, of activity out on the ice. I'm not sure if it was a, if it was a guide service in the area. Uh, but they had a bunch of kids out there uh, just fishing. And, um, and, and having a good time. So my first thought was, yeah, I didn't get to move around the lake as much as I wanted to, uh, two feet of snow can be a little bit challenging to move around in, especially got kids and, and whatnot. Uh, I'm extremely excited to get my flow tube out there, especially since, um, where the boat ramp is makes it easy enough to launch and not too much of an effort to kind of get out by the dam to get in a little bit deeper water. Um, based on what I'd seen with the kokanee coming into about 25 foot of water, I can imagine, you know, the brown trouts or the tiger muskies coming up that shallow to hunt them. So overall, I had a really good day. Uh, got to fish a new lake that I'd never fished before. Use the same. Justin. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry for, for just a second. You dropped out again there. Um, so can you hear me now? Yep. We got you. Okay. Uh, like I was saying, I'm extremely excited about this lake, uh, about this reservoir. I I intend on fishing it quite a bit more. I mean, traveling two hours is kind of a, a pretty standard thing for most of the fishing you and I do. Um, can't wait to get my flow tube out on it and, and start mapping it with my deeper uh, and becoming more and more familiar with it. I do want to try uh, the west side of the lake. Uh, I did see some brush sticking out, so I know it's extremely weedy over there, and uh, and I hope to go from there. So, so the trout that you're catching were holdover sizes. So, you know, and a holdover is what would you think? Uh, anywhere from maybe uh, twelve to fifteen, sixteen inches. Yeah, I would say that. I, I didn't get anything of substantial size. I didn't, you know, see a. a let's for the sake of it, we'll call them a a resident fish that's been around for quite some time, like you see at, uh, at 11 mile, uh, definitely holdovers from probably a, a previous year stocking. Um, uh, obviously the, the kokanee, I couldn't tell you much more about the kokanee than, than its size and, uh, its color, uh, not knowing, you know, the most recent stocking report for it and, and whether or not uh, it had a successful, um, breeding season, if you will. So, uh, Outside of that, yeah, not much more I can tell you about the species in the, in the actual lake from, from what I caught. So, and just for folks that might be wondering, what are they talking about holdover? Um, holdovers are, are what we refer to as trout and, and other fish. They get to a certain length to where we feel that they've been in there for a year. And granted, it might not be the most accurate term because a lot of times CPW stocks different sized uh, fish in different lakes. Um, but for the most part, a holdover trout's going to be, you know, that 12 to 15, 16 inches or so, you know, it's been there in the year and the, and their colors are going to be different and, and the meat's going to be a, a different, uh, uh, color, more, more of a pink or an orange versus the, the white stockish meat. Um, uh, so the, that's kind of the general description of a holdover. Am I missing anything on that one, Dustin? No, I, I really to, to honestly determine the difference between a holdover and a stocked rainbow, uh, is, filleting them uh it's if, if it's a stock rainbow with less than a year's time uh within a lake it's going to be it's going to have that white meat like you had mentioned yeah and i'll tell you a, a fish that's been in a lake for a year or so or longer definitely tastes better than a stalker so uh if you're out for great tasting trout uh put those stalkers back i mean the stalkers aren't bad bad to eat but boy holdover does taste a lot better and you get more meat it's a bigger fish and one thing I do want to mention real quick, as I am now, I'm kind of perusing through the documentation here provided by the CPW. In 2014, they stocked it with tiger trout. 
and 2015, they stocked it with the Snake River Native. So it's got cutthroat. It has cutthroat. So we got and two tigers and a cutthroat. We got tiger muskie, tiger trout, and a cutthroat. Yes. Wow. So, and that was from 2014 to 2015. Uh, I can I can imagine you know, a certain percentage of them probably is going to survive versus, you know, uh, uh, being eaten and everything else like that. And, again, not knowing the size of tiger trout they put in it, whether they were fingerlings or, or whatnot. Um, can't really speculate too much on that. But reading this, and the experience that I had out on the ice and the fact that it doesn't get heavily, heavily pressured like some of our other South Park lakes do. Yeah, um, let's I talk get, about the pressure on that. Yeah, so uh, the gentleman that I talked to, he says he's been fishing Clear Creek for, for years. Um, he shows up at, uh, I think, 8.30, and he says to me, yeah, this is the most people I've seen at this lake in forever. He's like, normally there's one or two huts out here, and that's about it. And I said, well, how frequently do you fish? He's like, yeah, I'm out here, you know, a couple of days out of the week. I come out with my boat. Uh, so I said, so it's not really heavily pressured. He's like, oh, no. I, you know, there's times he's on the lake. Nobody else is around for hours and hours and hours, uh, you know, days at a time. So to me, it sounds like the pressure on the lake is not nearly as much as you would have on Ontario or 11 Mile, uh, which has my interest peaked. There's got to be some monsters. Roman, yeah. this reservoir somewhere. You know, if there's kokanee in there, they're, they're, yeah, those browns will chase those kokanees and, and grab them. And plus, they're going to eat the stalker rainbows that they put in there too. So I bet there's some easily 28 to 30 inch browns in there. Yeah, you're you're probably big time on that. And there's probably some big tiger muskie in there because of that as well. Heck, there might even be a house of a rainbow. Um, one thing that you know, and this is pure speculation on my part, so don't take this to the bank. But the fact that there's tiger muskie in there and there's tiger trout in there, the CPW isn't going to put those, go through the, the expense of putting those expensive fish in those lake for no reason. So it leads me to believe that there is a population problem with one of the species that is currently in it. Um, maybe it's sucker fish. I, I don't know if there's brookies in there or some sort of uh, chub or some sort of other fish that uh, is not coming to mind that could be in there that could really be causing some issues. And that might be keeping the trout from getting fairly large, at least as far as rainbows. Um, I think browns will still feed on those suckers and get pretty big. They'll definitely feed on the younger suckers. Um, and same with the muskie. Um, so it's something that maybe uh, we'll have to, to make some phone calls and see if we can figure out that, that puzzle. Yeah, so, so the 2015 lake survey data published by the CPW uh, through their gill netting efforts Sucker, white sucker, 58% of the there lake's population. That's it right there. Even more outstanding is that uh, the rainbow trout is the 23% population and tiger muskie was 15%. You know, the fact that tiger muskie is 15 says something, and that's why that's on my list of lakes to really give a good go to try to get that fish at 10,000 casts. Oh, Absolutely. Uh, like I said, I think I've got at least two or three trips during the summer up there with uh, with my float tube or my personal pontoon boat or even or even uh, your boat to to really give it a great go uh, based on what I've seen and and how fast I I even got on fish. You know, there's there's times that I I can go to a lake and drill holes and not see fish for 15 20 minutes and want to move. Uh, first hole of the day, drop down, boom, fish were on the on the vex and and within 10 minutes of being there boom fish was out on the ice so i will tell you though that the uh, it seems like the conditions can be kind of harsh out there uh it's it's nestled in a nice little valley and when uh the wind came whipping through it dropped the temperatures and it became uh very difficult uh to keep everything from not freezing um it i hadn't had a an issue with fishing poles in a long time and uh, one of my older reels was actually freezing up on me because the wind was coming through uh, at such a high velocity. And with the temperatures outside, it, it made it uh, a little bit more difficult. So it might be challenging to some during the summer, uh, especially if you're going to use a, a float tube, a uh, personal pontoon boat, or, or a smaller watercraft. Um, I could definitely see uh, the winds and, and weather come whipping through there and, and having some issues. What's the elevation like on that lake? Do you know by chance? I do not. I didn't take an elevation. I didn't have a GPS with me that day. So is it 
does it seem pretty high up? Uh, you know what? Uh, if I had to gauge um, between, it's probably about the same elevation as as Ontario. Um, actually, let me let me go ahead and uh, take a look at that real quick. See if I can't pull up that information. Yeah. So, like, you know, when it comes to lakes like Antero and Eleven Mile and Spinny, and it seems like that this will be the same thing. It's you know high winds, afternoon winds, which uh, you know if you know how to fish that right is in open water, that'll catch you more fish actually. Um, and you know that's we'll save that for a whole other episode. Uh, we get off track, uh, we'll never recover. But it's just one of those things to where you know cold temps in the winter, wind chills and things like that. You got to be careful in the summertime. You got to watch for those winds and, and waves and then also thunderstorms and lightning. These, uh, these lakes are nothing to bat an eye out when they uh, start getting angry. So just as a reference, I was about a hundred feet off. Clear Creek Reservoir has an elevation of 8,875 feet and Entero has an elevation of 8,942. So how was the drive up from the Denver metro area? Uh, so, you know, we, we took uh, 285, uh, since I, I live in Castle Rock, it's easier to go up 470, took 285 uh, up through Morrison and then came down through Conifer and Bailey. And, and to be honest with you, uh, not having to fight ski traffic, not having to fight Colorado Springs traffic, uh, not having to fight Woodland Park traffic uh, was phenomenal. Uh, if, if you were to give me the choice to say, yeah, we can go have uh, a 10 to 20 fish day. Uh, with some brutes up at uh, Stagecoach, but you're going to sit in five hours worth of traffic or have no traffic at all and you're only going to catch holdovers, I might have to go for the holdovers just because the five hours sitting in traffic sometimes uh, on 70 is, is brutal. Well, and you got a chance at a tiger muskie and a tiger trout too, as well as cutthroat and, and, and big browns. So, you know, they, yeah, yeah, of course, that's going to be a great pick. Yeah, and you know, the other, like I said, the other nice part about that is if you're not having any success there, you can always drive up the road and hit Twin Lakes for some Lakers. So um, the last one is a little bit out of uh, left field, but a little bit of a fly fishing question there. You mentioned it early coming, coming on. Um, so did you get a good look at the tailwaters? I was looking at that on the map, and it looks like it's got a nice Y that dumps – right into the Arkansas River and I'm willing to bet you know if we go camping up there and we fish during the day um, on the float tubes we can go down those five weights and probably crush some big trout how did that look did it look like that's a good possibility uh, you know what I didn't actually get a good visual of the river uh, I seen it a couple of quick glances of it but I was so jones and hopped up that I was looking to my left uh, almost the entire time waiting for that turn so that I can make the turn and get on the ice. So uh, I didn't do my due diligence uh, to actually take a look and then take a peek at the river. Um, but I'm sure it's got to be, you know, fairly decent to phenomenal uh, type of fishing with it being there. So we'll just have to put that on the list to answer in a future episode after we uh, hit that on open water, huh? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's definitely one of those trips where, you are going to take all your gear and say, you know what, I'm going to go fly fishing at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, there's a, a, a fly fishing during a sunrise or sunset is it's up there. Like I like fishing period during those times, but there's something about fly fishing with that. And I don't know, it, it's one of those things. And you know, the last time that I had a really good fly fishing uh, experience during sunset, was actually at Red Feather Lakes. And we were going to talk about ice fishing up at Red Feather Lakes next. Uh, but I don't want to cut you off. Do you have anything else to add about uh, Clear Creek Reservoir? Uh, yeah, the one last thing to add is uh, it's one of the few uh, lakes uh, that you know, obviously there's there's this you know, river feeding it that you can snag kokanee during their spawn. So if you happen to be uh, uh, somebody that likes to snag kokanee, you can absolutely snag kokanee out there at Clear Creek Reservoir. Well, should we continue talking ice fishing? Yeah, let's go ahead. All right. Well, here we go with our second segment. Um, you know, I haven't been able to ice fish really at all except for one outing. Well, two outings, but one of them was a bust. Um, and then I was injured. And so I wanted to still be able to um, contribute to the, to the show with, with ice fishing. So I figured, well, let's talk about the place that I grew up and where I learned how to ice fish with my dad and his friends. Uh, from, you know, 
uh, the mid eighties all the way through, uh, the nineties. And, and even after I came back after the military in Iraq, that was one of the first places I went with my dad was ice fishing up at red feather lakes on, on Dowdy Lake. So I, I figured it'd be kind of fun to, to maybe tell a few stories and, and maybe give a short overview of each of the lakes. Uh, you've been up there. What's your first, what's your impressions on red feathers for, for folks that might not have been up there? You know, I, I really liked it. Uh, the fact is that you can fish a lot of the shoreline. Um, there is a lot of nice drop-offs right there as you come into the park. Uh, I want to say decent-sized rainbows for, for those uh, that have never really caught anything that's, you know, bigger than 24 inches. And I think it's a great place to go, especially if you got some kids. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's peaceful. There's not a whole lot of, of traffic, a whole lot of noise. Uh, overall, I had a great impression the, the few times that I've been up there. Yeah, for sure. And so there's four lakes, and then there's a lot more than four when it comes to Red Feather Lakes Village. But there's going to be four I want to highlight for for uh, ice fishing, and and that way we're not on here all night. And um, we can start with Dowdy. Uh, Dowdy is a great lake. It was made during the Depression times. Um, most of those roads and all that stuff up there was cut during the great depression with some of the work programs. And, um, actually, uh, they used to put trout that were stocked into Dowdy and they grow a bit bigger and they used to catch them and actually send them to the white house for Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, the, the rough rider, um, for white house dinners. So that's kind of a little, little historical fact. You won't get that too much out of us because there's not nothing that really compares to that, but, uh, Kind of a neat one with Dowdy. Uh, a big family history there. Dowdy used to actually hold some pretty big fish. Um, I've seen photos uh, of my grandpa who caught a massive brown that I would guess was 24, 25 inches out of, out of Dowdy. I don't know if there's any browns like that rolling around there these days. But I do know that CPW uh, occasionally, if they have got brooders left over in the um, – fish farms they'll dump them into dowdy before ice on so um, i know multiple folks that i fish with that have pulled up some nice 18 to 22 inch rainbows uh right during ice season so that, that's kind of a cool thing but dowdy's great uh kid friendly um we brought your son up there and he was catching fish right after left i mean how many how many different species did he catch up there uh you know i know for sure that uh i think you know he had the, a rainbow a brown and a sucker Yep. And then I think that trip, we also got uh, uh, a brook trout too as well, right? I believe so. Uh, we had definitely yep. a, a four species day. So, yeah, so it was kind of cool. Um, and and Dowdy's just a gorgeous lake. You know, the Ponderosa Pines up there, it's got amazing rock formations coming right out of the, out of the ice or the open water, depending on the, the season. And like Dustin was saying, there's like easy parking and easy access for like half the shoreline. So for folks that aren't moving so well, like me, and, uh, you know, or if you got kiddos there, you just want to get up for a good half day of fishing or whatnot. Dowdy's a great lake. And like most of these mountain lakes in the afternoon, it can get fairly breezy. So something to keep an eye on, but it's always got a good bite. And, you know, you go in there with a, a small Z-Ray, small cast master, you know, your, your power bait specials, um, heck worms, uh, a little jig and wax worm. There's not much there that they're not going to bite on. Sometimes you'll have to uh, finagle and figure out just a certain pattern of a jig or a certain certain bait. But once you hammer it, it's going to be like fish after fish after fish. And uh, yeah, you'll do good. So one thing that I kind of found interesting last time we were there, Dustin, is you had your aqua view at the time. And we were getting all sorts of readings on um, my Hummingbird Helix 5 and your Vexlar. And we're like, we're seeing way more fish under the water than we were getting hits on, but they kept checking it out. And then like, it seemed like every fifth or sixth fish would come in and hit. And we're like, well, why aren't the other ones hitting? We should have a lot more hitting from what we're seeing. And it turns out that once you stuck down your aqua view, we were seeing like literally like, suckers swimming around like they were a school of sharks getting ready to like eat some poor dead fish. I mean, they were just kind of everywhere and I'd never seen suckers kind of behave like that. And it threw me off. I thought they were trout to be honest from the, uh, fish finder readings. Um, so, uh, that kind of piqued, piqued my curiosity and, you know, I haven't looked into it yet, but daddy has got to have a massive percentage of suckers. You don't happen to know what it is. Do you, you know, I don't, but, uh, Based on, on looking at the aqua view when we were up there that day, and like you said, they were swimming around like, like sharks in, in a blood-filled pool. 
I, I can only imagine it's probably got to be up in, you know, double digit 20 to 25 percent of that lake. Yeah. So, you know, and one thing about these suckers is, um, yeah, I think hopefully maybe CPW can a- address that with Dowdy and get it back to where it was when I was a kid and things like that with a little bit bigger fish. Um, it does have a high pressure fishing, so maybe that's not a realistic possibility. But with those suckers, Dowdy actually does freeze earlier in the ice season. It does freeze uh, early November a lot of times. You just to be careful and use, use your precautions. There's no such thing as safe ice. But you can get out there and throw a night crawler on the bottom with a hook and a split shot, and you can catch yourself – a bunch of suckers and freeze those things. And that way you've got lake trout bait and you're not paying five, $6 per sucker at the bait shop. Um, so a little, little tip there. If you, if you like to go catch the bait for the Lakers. Um, so that's something we were planning to do this year before, uh, before I went down bum. So, but um, yeah, I mean, what's, what are your thoughts on Dowdy? Uh, you know, like I said, I, I liked it. It, um, it definitely shows some promise with, with the Laker bait. Um, you know, after seeing what I've seen through the aqua view and the behavior, I, I would definitely continue to hit it up. Uh, I liked it. My kid likes it. And, you know, I, I believe there was actually, a, a a couple of events or at least a couple of years ago, uh, that was held on that lake as well. And I think everybody had a great time there too. So overall it's good family fun fishing. Yeah. Uh, a couple last notes, you know, I was just coming to mind. Um, I, I, the rainbow trout there have had issues and I don't know if they still do. When we were there, I didn't see any obvious issues last year fishing them, but it's had a history of gill lice and whirling disease in there. So something to just keep in mind. Um, for the most part, most of the rainbows you're going to catch in there are stalkers. Um, the browns will get a little bit bigger, uh, but every once in a while you'll run into a year where you'll get rainbows that are 15, 16 inches there. And then obviously those brooders that they dump in occasionally. Um, one other thing about Dowdy is if you're walking in and around there, and especially if you're getting around to the backside of the lake where it's not as easy access, it's kind of a moose area. So just keep an eye out and be careful there. You know, if that moose has that shoreline, that's his shoreline, find another fishing spot. <laughs> um, so uh, let, let's move on and, and talk about the next most popular lake at, at Red Feathers. And um, it's right next door to Dowdy. It's West Lake. There's actually a trail that connects the two uh, back um, – on the backside of both lakes. Uh, and I think they're fed by the same Creek or irrigation ditch. I'm not quite sure on that, but West Day Lake is another easy access. You can walk 10 feet from the truck and be ice fishing and, and catching fish. And you can throw a rock back and hit, hit your truck. Uh, it's one of those things to where um, the fish might be a tad bit smaller than Dowdy, but you're going to catch them more often. And it's mostly rainbows. Occasionally you get a brown. I've never really got a sucker or anything else there. Um, but it is one of those things where you can almost send down a jig without even bait on it, and you're going to catch one after another. So it's a good time if you want numbers, if you want your kid to get used to feeling a bite, or you're just introducing somebody new to fishing or ice fishing. It's a great way to experience a bite and learn how to set a hook. Um, and it's still fun when you're catching numbers, catching fish, no matter the size is fun, right? Who, whoever caught a fish and didn't have fun. That's just, you know, one of those things. And Bel Air is down the road, um, from West and Dowdy a little bit. You have to use uh, Google maps to find this one, but it, and it's a little bit of a hike in depending if the gates open or not, you might be able to get it early season where the gate is open and you can still drive in, but once they shut it, um, you'll just have to walk in with your sled and just go with a hand auger. Um, you don't have to bring everything crazy. You don't even need electronics. It's like, this is one of these lakes to where um, I used to fish it as a kid and I would literally just put a hook in the water and I would catch trout. I, I think they're starving in there. I can't, can't explain it any other way. Um, but it's one of those things to where it's just as fast as you can put, put the hook down and put it out. We've caught fish and, and, and Bel Air's always been that. And it's a beautiful kind of secluded lake and these nice, um, you know, uh, built up dockways all the way around and, and things like that and great rocks and, and it's gorgeous. And another great place to hike in with your, with, with kiddo. If you just want to get away from it, if you want to get away from the dowdy crowd and you're willing to walk a little bit, you, you'll have a spot to yourself and you'll have a great time at Bel Air. And then, um, Parvin, you fished Parvin with me, haven't you? Actually, this is one that I have not got to fish with you. Uh, the day we were going to go, uh, the winds were uh, extremely bad. 
And uh, we ended up getting about 10 feet away from the truck and realizing, yeah, probably not a good day without a hut. And I, we didn't want to drag uh, my 45 pound hut uh, that far to the lake. So this one, I have not had the pleasure of fishing with. Yeah. So, so Parvin, so let's, let's just put it this way. Like Westlake and Bel Air are like beginner mode. Uh, you know, Dowdy is, you know, a little bit more difficult, but still kind of beginner mode. Parvin is extremely hard. <laughs> it, it's feast or famine. Get ready for the skunk. Uh, most people do two or three trips there. Um, and they'll get, catch fish on one of the trips. But I, I've noticed when they are biting and when you do get there on a trip when they're biting, you will get a good number of fish, and but you're also going to get bigger fish. And um, to be honest, the biggest rainbow trout I've ever seen caught personally uh, was at Parvin and it was 26 plus inches. Um, so it's, it's definitely a different, uh, different lake than the other ones. Um, it sets up differently. It's got deeper waters. Um, it's got a lot more weed beds. It's got weed beds. Like you'd almost see it uh spinny or antero in, in sections of it. And it's, it's very unique. So one of the things about Parvin though, is it's a, a flies and lures only lake. And they've got very strict limits, and I don't want to quote them because I don't know them off the top of my head, but they got very strict limits on what you can keep and not keep, so definitely know that before going there. And the flies and lures there is no joke. It's actually a state research facility for uh, trout. And so they stock all sorts of different trout in there to see how they'll do with um, other species and stuff like that. And, um, and probably make a great show to, to do an interview from a biologist there to figure out all the mad scientist stuff that's going on in that lake. But it's an amazing, amazing lake. There's moose there. It's gorgeous. I've rustled up bobcats out of the bushes next to the lakeside. They've scared the heck out of me. So lots of wildlife. And um, it's supposedly got tiger muskie in it. I've never seen one. I've never met anybody or even heard a story of a tiger muskie being caught there. So if you're out there and you've got proof of a tiger muskie, um, coming out of Parvin, I, I will give you a prize. <laughs> so I, I've asked that question on Hardwater Warriors once and nobody can answer. Um, so I'm still curious if they're in there. I, you know, According to stocking reports, it's been a long, long, long time since they've been stocked in there. But supposedly they're in there. Um, but the trout are, are pretty awesome there. When, and getting back to the flies and lures only, they're really serious about it. You better be using no bait, no plastics, no scents nothing you better be using literally a fly or a lure like a cast master or some sort of jig with no plastics or scents um i've always gone there and had luck on z rays of course i, I talk that up everywhere i go that's kind of my go-to spoon um cast masters have worked well there jigging that uh you know one lure that work, really really works well there when the bite is is good is a pink hd ice um and you can jig that uh, in multiple different places um, there and and one tip I'll give to, to everybody with Parvin when it comes to ice fishing: use the choke points, um, use the maps, use the the, the topography to your uh, advantage because it's a hard enough lake to fish the way it is. So I've always kind of set up in choke points between the little points and islands and uh, things like that to where I think fish are coming through, uh, whether they're going to or from feeding or they're just swimming. Um, and I've had better success doing that, but I still get my fair share of skunks there. Um, and that's what this show is all about is fighting the skunk. So we're going to set ambushes and choke points to find these fish, uh, for you military guys out there. Um, but that's kind of parvin in a nutshell. And, um, it's honestly one of my favorite lakes to float tube in the state. And it's one of those lakes to where, I can go in there at the float tube and just with the wildlife and the nature and just the way the lake is absolutely gorgeous. I can go in there and float tube and not have a bite all day. And I will leave just feeling like I had the best day ever. And it's, I love fishing Parvin. It's, it's a good one. It's snaggy. That place has claimed a lot of my jerk baits. <laughs> so that keep in mind with that. So, uh, um, if you're into using expensive jerk baits and things like that, open water, uh, just be prepared to use, uh, lose them. So, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the stuff about the choke point there because uh, as you were talking, I pulled up Google Earth, and uh, <clears throat> and again, it's a great resource it, it, whether it you pay for it or or just use the the generic one. But I can already see a couple of natural choke points that I would absolutely try to set up in and just sit there most of the day. Yeah, um, you know, most of most of my success has come from finding deep water. Um, or those choke points. Um, 
Yeah, surprisingly in the weeds or just off the weed beds has not produced a lot for me there, even in the summertime. Um, some of my go-tos there uh, are the Rebel Crawdad. That's a great one for the trout. They love crushing that thing. There's a lot of crayfish in there. Um, and like I said, those spoons, the Z-rays and stuff, but dynamic lures have, have always done me really well there as well as far as the uh, HD trout and the, um, the J-spec. Um, I do kind of pinch down the barbs a lot of times on the HD trout because they're pretty hard on the fish there. Um, I, so just a little note for whatever reason they, they, they get wrapped up in a net or they just get, get multiple trebles going in those HDs and, and trout have a hard time surviving that. So, uh, just a little tip there. Um, obviously it's at your discretion. The J specs, I've not had as much of an issue with really harming fish that you didn't tend to release. So, but, um, yeah, that's kind of parvin and red feathers in a nutshell. There's lots of places to camp, lots of lodging up there. So it's a great weekend getaway. There's lots of cabin rentals. So if you want to get away with the guys or whatnot for the weekend and drink a lot of beer and go ice fishing, it's a great place to do it. Um, sometimes Dowdy will get a little crowded with shelters and stuff on there. It's kind of a popular area to go. But uh, there's a lot of different options up there. And there's a lot of other lakes, too. Most of them are private. And uh, maybe we'll come back and revisit uh, – um, red feathers and talk about some more parvin after a trip there this summer no absolutely i'm, I'm i want to put uh the personal pontoon boat on as many lakes uh, or reservoirs that i can this year uh, and now i've gotten a little bit more used to fishing um <clears throat> smaller than uh than the larger reservoirs uh it's really got me jonesing for some soft water yeah. And you know, another thing, if you're, and I think he's got a lot of them on YouTube now, but if you look up Fishful Thinker, Chad LaChance, most of you out there will know him. If you're listening to this, you probably know him, but he actually has a whole episode of Fishful Thinker on Parvin. So they give you a little insight of this if you're really thinking about going up there to fish. So, um, yeah, it's just Red Feathers is, is an awesome, it's an awesome little town. It's, it's away from the ski resorts and it, it, it it's just great. It's great people and great fishing up there. So can't say enough about it. So uh, what do we got on the agenda next here? So uh, you feel like talking about a little, just, just a little bit, just, we'll just dive into a little bit of uh, some ice off bite. Uh, yeah, we could probably uh, stand about, uh, you know, five to ten minutes of ice off bite if uh, you want to jump into it yeah yeah you know and uh, we don't have to go into great detail but let's just just plant that seed of ice off it's what is today the february 11th yeah i mean it's supposed to hit 60 degrees in denver this week you know a lot of the lakes are going to be icing off here uh in the denver metro i bet there's some boat ramps open end of february early march so um, I'm glad you brought that up that it's February 11th. So for all of our, our, our female listeners out there, uh, you know, Valentine's day is on the 14th and now's a great time to, to go out and get that special someone, uh, some ice off gear, like, you know, a Z ray or yes. some jerk baits. Um, just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah. Good point. Good point. We can always use more tackle. Always. <laughs> There's never ending tackle. I will get more bins if I have to. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, so there's a lot, there's so much to ice off. We could really talk about this as a whole show in itself. And I think we'll, we'll break it up into other shows too. So this is more of a preview, but kind of what I was thinking about is all the different opportunities from ice off. And most people think ice off. They're thinking what I just mentioned right here at front Ridge, it goes off. And then, you know, the mountains like lakes like Spinney and Antero will ice off sometime towards April, um, that end of March, starting to get into April in there and everybody roots for opening day of Spinney and all that. And I saw fishing for a few different species in Colorado is some of the best bites for those species. And to be honest with you, uh, I saw walleye, I saw rainbow trout and I saw cutthroat trout come to mind and they're almost at three different times. Like it's, you can hit them at, so like I can go walleye fishing, uh, pre-spawn and, and post spawn just after the ice off and, and catch some of the, some walleye from shore and have, and have better odds and, and, and better odds of getting a bigger fish than at any other time. And, um, so that's just weeks away. And then 
you know, we scoot in from March to April and then we got ice off in the mountains and, you know, come on, Dustin, is there, uh, what's that rainbow trout bite? Like as soon as the ice is off up there. Oh, it, it can get fast and furious. Uh, especially since there's no, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, um, any hatch going on, uh, not any significant hatch going on at that time. So, uh, like you said, the, the lakes that haven't seen any pressure, like your spinnies, um, or, or have had very concentrated pressure, like your uh, 11 mile in certain coves and whatnot. Um, now you get a whole bunch of people with different boats and, uh, hell, I'm even guilty of this, um, uh, going out on a, on a pontoon or a personal pontoon boat, uh, in that frigid cold water chasing after some of those monster trout up in a, up in those iced off lakes. I guarantee you, you watch Facebook and somebody's going to be on the shore of Antero when it's like half ice and half open water and they're going to be pulling monsters with power bait. You watch. It, it's happened the last couple of years and it'll happen again this year at Ice Off. Um, so it's going to be a great bite no matter what your whatever your favorite trout lake is. If you can put a boat on it or fish it from shore at Ice Off, it, it's, it's going to be great. It's going to be some of the best fishing all year round for trout. And then when I think in cutthroat, ice off you know i'm i'm thinking like well maybe i can find some lakes in may but really it's going to be june and even some of my favorite cutthroat lakes will go all the way almost to the fourth of july before they ice off and it's the same thing as the trout you know those cutthroat start patrolling the shorelines and you get out there with your five weight and, and a woolly bugger or a black ant or you can get out there with an hd trout or a z ray or something like that and on the smaller size and and you can really uh have a good day on the cutthroat trout. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of high Alpine lakes that if you're watching, uh, you can get, you can do high Alpine ice off from mid May all the way to July. So there's, you know, it all depends on, you know, where the lake's positioned within the mountain, how much wind and, and sun it gets and all that stuff that when it's going to come off. And, you know, a lot of these fly shops in and around those areas will, will help you out with that too. So, and, uh, I can help you out with Indian Peaks Ice Off and Rocky Mountain National Park. So if you got, uh, if you're curious about you know a certain lake that you might want to hit for cutthroat or brookies, uh, ping me and I'll give you my best guess of when I think it will come off based off of my experience in past years. And granted, sometimes it's a, a give or take a week here or there. Um, but uh, so the way I see it, from about two maybe three weeks from now, it's going to be great fishing that you can hit multiple ice off um, opportunities. Um, all the leading all the way to summer fishing. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, uh, you know, Indian Peaks, that's one that uh, I can't wait to hit again this year. Uh, I was unfortunate. Uh, the skunk got me that day uh, that we went up, but uh, I still had a blast and, and I'd love to have the opportunity to actually redeem myself on that particular lake. Uh, I don't get skunked very often, uh, but when it does happen, it seems to be on a lake that you know very well and you always point me in the wrong direction and I never get anything. So, um, that's one I would love to have a, a, a do over and a redeem trip on for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and you know, I'll be there for sure. Uh, um, the Indian peaks and, and my brookies are, uh, gotta love them. So, Absolutely. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have anything else you wanted to, to add to, uh, the ice off bite coming up? Uh, you know, not really. Uh, I think we've, you know, three good species cover it. Uh, obviously, once you get talking into a, a little bit more of the, the warm weather species, we're we're way past ice off. But uh, uh, you know, that we could save that for another episode. Yeah, for sure. And we'll be talking a lot of it coming up. Um, you know, we're going to try to do our best to stay consistent putting episodes out. Uh, we got two weeks in a row and I feel pretty good to two episodes. I feel really great about this. I, I wish I could go fishing tomorrow instead of work, but uh, the, the cards aren't in that for me. Either way, I still got a few more weeks before I can hit the lake. And I, I tell you what, I don't even care if I get skunked that day. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> so... Um, so I don't know. Let's tease a little bit about what we got coming up. I don't want to make promises for what we'll have in what show, but I've been working on lining some things up for everybody to to bring some folks on and and to have some great topics to talk about to help people, uh, you know, finish out ice season and then also go into uh, spring fishing. And so I was just talking to John Schneider, um, 
writer for Vantage Fishing, a uh, friend of the radio show. He was on uh, the uh, Ice Fishing Roundtable. He's going to come on and possibly in the next week or two talk ice fishing with us and what he's been up to. Um, so I'll look forward to that. He's always very innovative and got great ways of doing things that I never even thought about. So, um, yeah, he's always a great one to have on the show. And then uh, Dustin will be at the St. Vrain uh, Fishing Experience. You want to talk about that one a little bit? Yeah, you know, we we – we did this last year, and we had a blast. Uh, I think we're going to take a little bit different approach to this, but I strongly suggest <clears throat> anybody who can make it out to the St. Brain Fishing Experience uh, take advantage of it. There's going to be a lot of people there talking about a lot of different fishing, uh, and I know that there's a lot of people out there who, who do fish it, who ice fish it and everything else like that. So uh, it should be another fantastic year. I think this is its second year that, that it'll be around, and, um, you know, the CPW does a great job of putting this on. Yeah, for sure. And so we'll be talking that up a little bit as we get closer. And then, um, you know, uh, I just had the great interview with Robert McCormick, vice president of Trout Unlimited, the Boulder Flycasters um, chapter, uh, about a big uh, renovation and a project going on on Boulder, Boulder Creek. So it'll be a great one for fly fishing. And I know a lot of people spin fish the creek too. Uh, I know Jeremy Anui is a big fan of uh, – fly fish in the creek. So it'll be good to hear what's going on there and what they're doing to increase trout habitat and make fishing better in Boulder County. Um, and then I've been talking a little bit with James Trujillo and I think I might have him convinced to come on the show and talk about uh, catching some walleye from shore here at, at, at ice off. Uh, this guy is the who's who of catching walleye from shore. I don't think there's anybody better in Colorado and maybe even in the country that can get on walleye from shore like this guy. And he can do it year round, except for when there's ice. Um, and he generally outfishes guys. James on shore will outfish guys on a boat for walleye most of the time. And uh, so if we're lucky enough to have him on and talk a little bit of walleye, I think that'd be great. Um, so I'll keep, keep working on that. So. Yeah. You know, I, uh, for a lot of anglers here in Colorado, uh, we know that the, the spring walleye bite, uh, is a pretty big event. I, I know I, I've tried to compete with some of those guys in my little tiny uh, boat, uh, my 12 foot, uh, we'll call it a bathtub because it's really what it was uh, out with some of the bigger boats and whatnot. And, you know, it's a blast and knowing and not personally knowing James, but seeing what he does through Facebook and some of the photos and talking to him, uh, fishing from shore uh, and seeing how he does it and how he works his, his baits almost makes up for not being able to get on the water. Like you said, it, it's, it's a phenomenal thing to watch. Uh, I know you and I tried to uh, duplicate that uh, at least once last year uh, with unfortunately minimal success just because we're so new at it and we're so used to fishing from a boat. But, you know, the spring walleye and having James on the show, I think is going to be, you know, a huge benefit to a lot of people who, who want to continue to shoreline fish or, or maybe you have not had as much success shoreline fishing for, for spring walleye. Uh, so I look forward to that myself. Yeah. And you know, that spring walleye bite is going to be all up and down the front range and, you know, anywhere with rocky structure, um, that it's going to be enticing to walleye. I mean, I'm thinking of union reservoir. I'm thinking of Boulder reservoir. I'm thinking of Boyd, Carter, Cherry Creek, Chatfield, Pueblo. I mean, Horse Dude, there's going to be a plethora of these reservoirs to try this out at. So um, it's something that everybody should be pretty excited about, and everybody should at least try to give an afternoon and evening to give their shot at a huge hoss of a walleye. So uh, I know James and I were, were fishing last year, and a gentleman close next to us um, started hooting and hollering. And we, we shined some flashlights over and he's pulling in a massive, if I remember right, I want to say it was like 32 inch female Y never seen anything like it before. And you know what? So I will always devote at least a few evenings to, uh, doing some shore fishing for walleye every year at ice off after that. It's, it's definitely something to do. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, I think that wraps it up for this show. I just want to thank everybody for listening. Um, and, you know, if you've, found value or you enjoy the radio show and our blogs, please like and share. Um, and, and thank you for following uh, Vantage Fishing. And uh, any questions, comments, concerns are, are always welcome. Send them our way. We got email. Uh, you can comment through our Facebook page, comment on our website. 
Um, and we're always looking for uh, great folks who are willing to tell fishing stories and are willing to write or come on the show. So if it's something you're interested in, just hit us up. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and on that, you know, fight the skunk. Fight the skunk. 